Hello, this is Daniel King with my report on round seven of the London Chess Classic. I'm actually still in the commentary room. There's here here in London. Um, there's still one game still in progress. That's between Michael Adams and Luke McShane. I think that's still going to go on a very long time. And Adams is grinding away. Really, only two results are possible. It's either going to be a win for Adams or a draw. McShane is suffering, but okay, that's going to go on a long time. So I'm picking as my play of the day the game between Hikaru Nakamura and Magnus Carlsen. Um, this was a fascinating game from start to finish. Both players said afterwards that the position, the, the opening that arose on the board Neither of them expected it, but anyway, both just wanted an interesting game, and uh, well, they certainly got it. So it's a c3 Sicilian, and Carlson played knight to f6. That's probably the variation that keeps the most tension in the position. So Carlson, even with the black pieces, looking to hope, you know, maybe play for a win. Okay, bishop c4. This is very theoretical, and Carlson declined to play the sharpest move, you could say, um, which is knight b6 and then you know, possibly c4. I mean, th this can lead to very interesting positions, but probably there's too much theory on this kind of thing. Um, and instead he played e6, which is somehow uh, more classical, more solid. You know, black just brings out his pieces unpretentiously with, uh, well, d6 followed by bishop e7, as in the game. So, white claims some space in the middle, and d6, so just challenging white's pawn on e5. Well, you can probably hear in the background some noise, there's still some analysis going on next door, uh, among other things. Okay, white castle, this is all very standard, and as I said, unpretentious development from Carlson. And now, with this pawn on e5, this does give white the chance to try and develop an attack on the king side because you can see that e4 square has been vacated so this diagonal is open and that gives white some space perhaps you can cut your bishop back so queen e2 is a very natural move here and castles from black so let me see rook d1 was played by nakamura you can also um, well, there are, there are many ways to try to build an attack for white. I mean, one possibility here is to play bishop d2, followed by knight c3. You can also play knight c3 straight away. Now, this is very committal because it means that white's pawn structure on the queen side is broken. You can see there's an isolated c pawn. But it does clear the situation and allows white's queen to swing over uh, in the right circumstances to, to the king side. Um, and of course this diagonal is open. So that's one possibility, but obviously very a, a little bit risky. You could also simply take on d6 and arrive at an isolated queen pawn position here. That's also very possible and of course with the space advantage that white has with the pawn on d4 that does give you some attacking possibilities or well there's quite a, a tedious line you could take on d5 and then play bishop f4 playing for a very slight edge um, Kramnik mentioned this in his commentary um, you know, perhaps that's a very Kramnik like way of playing the position not playing for the attack directly but trying to squeeze a slight advantage out of the position. Uh, when I mention this to both players after the game, they just kind of turn their nose up at it very quickly. They just thought, ah, it's a draw, it's too equal. Not enough going on. So, Nakamura played a3. Well, this can be a useful move because you're taking away the b4 square from a knight. So it means you might be able to cut back with the bishop to develop play on this diagonal. And now I was kind of surprised by Nakamura's move. He played b4. To my eyes, white should be concentrating on the king side. And b4, although it gains ground, it does rather weaken these squares on the c-file, as we'll see, and actually makes it more difficult for white to develop his pieces. 
So a6 and bishop d3, okay, the bishop cuts back. And now b5 and h4 from Nakamura. Now, I was kind of surprised that Nakamura, you know, having first played b4, then went h4. It seems to me this was too ambitious. And after Carlson's next move, simple development, I think we can see that it's extremely difficult for white to continue any kind of attack on, on the king's side when your pieces on the queen side haven't really developed. And development is a problem. So, okay, it would be lovely if we could somehow swing a knight on b1 over to the king's side, but well, you can't play knight bd2 because knight f4 is on. You can't play bishop b2. Again, knight f4 is a move. Um, I guess you could play bishop d2 to try to get in knight c3, but, well, after those pieces are traded, um, I don't see how white is going to build up a kingside attack. And as I said, I think these squares on the queen side, they're all a bit weak, and black's pieces are very well placed. So Nakamura attempted rook a2, and he wants to swing the rook over and somehow join in the attack, but this allows a big shot for Carlson, which he spotted straight away. He played knight takes b4. Now, I don't know whether Nakamura overlooked this exactly, or whether he sort of didn't think much of it, but this is a very straightforward and very attractive way for black to play. So the next few moves are completely forced. Well, you have to take the knight. Knight takes pawn, threatening rook and bishop. So, well, in fact, because of the threat to the, the bishop on c1, then white has to defend the bishop on d3. Now, again, these next moves are forced. These pieces were exchanged. You can't play rook takes because the, the bishop on c1 is hanging. Rook d8, Carlson exchanges rooks. So, black has sacrificed a piece, but you can see that white's minor pieces are rather dreadful, and black has the two bishops. And this is a very interesting situation. Carlson very quickly exchanged off bishop for knight, shattering white's kingside pawns, and got a third pawn for the piece. Now, we'll come back to this position in a second. That was the game continuation. But Kramnik, for, ex for instance, who was spectating today, he had the free day, he really liked Black's position and was actually very surprised that Carlson took so quickly on f3. He liked simply playing with the two bishops, for example playing h6, now that gives the king an escape square on h7, so you don't have to worry about the back rank. It also prevents bishop g5 possibly exchanging bishops, activating um, white's bishop. So this bishop isn't, is nothing special on c1. White's knights are going nowhere. In fact, there are simply no weaknesses in black's position. Such a solid pawn structure. Now, you could sink the bishop on d d5 if necessary, and simply start advancing the queenside pawns. Now, you only have two pawns for the piece, but these two bishops are so strong. And the queenside pawns are menacing. Black's queen is active. And if the worst comes to the worst, you might be able to snatch off say the pawn on e5 or pawn on h4 anyway. And Kramnik was actually very optimistic about black's chances here. So maybe Carlson missed, missed a good chance. Carlson said after the game actually that he took the pawn because, well, he was felt very optimistic about black's chances here. But I think Nakamura defended very accurately indeed. Queen d7 was a very good move. At first Carlson thought Queen e1 might be good, but actually, here, after this exchange, well, mate is threatened on the back rank, so h6 has to be played. But then the queen comes back very quickly, and you do so with checks, and then you activate your knight. And now black has to be very careful indeed. If the knight manages to activate in combination with the queen, then black's king can be in trouble. And white's king actually gets great protection from these double pawns. So the initiative could swing over to white in that situation. So Carlson was forced to play more modestly with bishop f8. 
and now bishop e3 good move so the, the bishop is rock solid on e3 a5 okay the pawn storm down the board and this next move from Nakamura I really like queen e8 this is a multi-purpose move for a start well obviously there are going to be threats on the back rank you know if we can try to attack the bishop on f8 so ties black down there it also, to some extent, some extent keeps black's pawns in check because it's it's much harder to advance these pawns on the queen side. For instance, after b4, well, the queen still controls the a4 square. Carlson played h6, king g2, excellent move from Nakamura. The king is completely safe, and it means that after a4, the knight can come to a3, so there's no longer a check on a1. Uh, which would pick up the knight. And this knight suddenly flies into the game. So b4, forced, obviously the pawn on b5 was attacked. The knight comes in. And now, actually, Carlson realized that he has to be very, very careful. He had to put the queen back here, because this knight is just hopping around to d7 with some deadly threats. So, for example, if a3, if Carlson were to carelessly keep pushing these pawns. Knight d7 is an absolute killer, and the pawns aren't in time. So Carlson appreciated he had to make a draw, and he managed to do this very simply with this move. So it forces the queen away. Carlson took on h4, so it's still three pawns for the piece, but clearly the kingside pawns are going nowhere and with just one pawn on the queen side it's nothing special the queen came back well he has to defend has to be careful keep hold of the bishop on f8 and now he can distract white's queen and well black has enough counterplay here the game finished knight d7 the bishop was taken now there's there's no time to make a queen because there's knight g6 and knight takes queen on e7. Uh, so Carlson had to take. Now the queen comes to pick up the b pawn. So they were left with this endgame. And Carlson defended this very accurately by putting the pawns all on dark squares. It means this bishop has no prospects at all to somehow break in and find a weakness. And well, let me see, about 20 moves later, they agreed to draw. Nakamura can make absolutely no progress with his extra piece in this position. So, fascinating game actually. Um, but maybe Carlson missed a very good chance to press Nakamura halfway through. So, the standings well, as I said, we're waiting for one game to finish. Adams, if he can win that, will have really good chances to um, press the, the leader, um, Carlson. You know, this. It's not over. Carlson actually has only one more game in the tournament. Kramnik uh, still has two more games, so he is fighting for first place still. Um, but Carlson is way out in the lead still with plus five. But as I said, he only has one game to go, so all to play for. Thanks very much for watching.